Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the uh, University of Berkeley <laughs> Annex. <laughs> Down the road, this is a interesting kind of social gathering, and I said a bit of a code a hybrid hybridity here. Very glad to introduce uh, Dr. Victor Gonzalez. Say just a few words. Uh, Victor is a postdoctoral fellow at RITMO. Uh, which is the University of Oslo's Center for Interdisciplinary Study of Rhythm in all its myriad human manifestations in biology, behavior, society, and culture. Victor is originally from Mexico, where he received his mechatronics engineering degree and mechanical engineering master's from the National Autonomous University of Mexico. He went on to earn a PhD from University of Sheffield, in the field of hand movement analysis. At Sheffield, he also served as graduate training assistant and facilitator for mechanical engineering courses and worked on improving employability conditions of people with learning disabilities. Victor is interested uh, broadly, and let me know if I get this right, in the dynamism of biological systems in action. In particular, he studies rhythm as a facet of biological dynamism he wishes to understand how rhythm is situated within socio-cultural mechanisms, both emerging from individual activity in society and contributing to collective practice. So at its broadest, Victor is interested in rhythm as the secret sauce connecting the kinesiological and the cognitive, which is of course what my own lab investigates, so hence the interest and in why Victor is here. So please join me in welcoming Victor to the Graduate School of Education, home away from home, Oko Cafe. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so my, as Bill mentioned, my, my PhD was in human movement analysis, uh, biomechanics, but focusing on only kinematics. So I wasn't interested in the forces that produce the movement, I was only interested in velocities, coordination. And then I came to Oslo, or I went to Oslo to do my, my postdoc in a project called uh, Micro, which is the one I'm going to talk about today. And uh, Micro was a project that uh, uh, Ritmo's uh, deputy director, Alexander uh, Jensenius, he got funding for, for the Micro project, which is about small body responses to music. So he's interested in why music makes us move, uh, why we move the way we do to music, and why we move the way we do when we make music. But in a very in a small scale. So we're talking about millimeters. Mostly movement, but also breathing patterns, physiological responses, uh, heart, heart rate, uh, eye tracking, uh, pupillometry, everything in response to music. So we're interested in understanding what music makes to our bodies, uh, to our brains. Mostly, at least in my case, to our bodies. So, <clears throat> The way Micro started this project about responses to music is uh, by with this paradigm uh, we call the Norwegian Championship of Standstill, in which we ask individuals to stand as still as possible and we play segments of music of different kinds. Yeah, can you hear? I can go to the, or to the center. Yeah. So, we invite people to our lab in groups and we ask them to stand as still as possible. We tell them that there will be music playing and that it will last six minutes. There will be segments of music and segments of absence of music, in like all uh, randomized pieces of music. And it was silence, music, silence, music for six minutes. And we are measuring a head movement with a optical motion uh, capture system. So we're just interested in this case in, in one marker on the top of their heads. We have 10 people at the center in the, in the lab standing in rows. And then we just measure how much they move. The person who moves the least at the end of the day wins 1,000 pounds, like $100. Uh, they're, they're trying to resist moving. Yes. They're trying to... Resist. So we want them to try. Yeah. Exactly. We run a similar paradigm, but without the price and without instructing them to stand as still as possible. We just said stand naturally, and then they would. Pro some of them danced, some of them moved more, some of them treated the silent segments as a like a rest, 
and they would not try to not move during the music and then move during the silence like to relax and then again start. we don't we didn't want that for the subject we wanted them to try to try to resist the music and we played originally every year we change the music style depending on the findings that we have we have been running this every year since 2012 i wasn't there for the first three or four but i've been here i've been there since 2017 so 17 18 and 19 I've been involved in the execution and the analysis of the data. Uh, it's, it was in the news, I think some of you saw the video in the news. Um, I just want you to see how it looks, kind of, the lab or the, the situation. So I'll play this video and I'll do my screen like this or, yeah, or I'll put it here. So this is a... Uh, the quality is very bad. And this is uh, the news, the main Norwegian BBC. <laughs> And this is a reporter running the the note. She she first went to interview a, a royal palace guard, asking him what does he do to stand because she's going to participate. <laughs> so she wants some tips. And the guard just says, "I'm just uh, focus my sight on something, and I try not to think too much." We interestingly not this year. This is probably from 2015. But in um, last year we had a royal guard, a royal palace guard, as one of our participants, wow. and he didn't do very well. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently they do move a little bit. So they would. their strategy for standing for hours is that they do move. So they come to the lab. I'll just fast forward to the point where she's standing still. Very bad for your body to be standing for 12 hours. Still so yeah. Long. yeah. So even six minutes can be just for some people even quit in the middle of uh, uh, three minutes because they start to feel bad. Too much pressure and anxiety kicks in. So Hand out chiropractor cards. Yeah, <laughs> this is where you should be. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me see. I have a video of the proper experiment. Cake anyone? Uh, I'm okay. <laughs> Okay. okay, so I'll show you now how it actually how the experiment looks. It's this one was an eight minutes uh, championship of fasting. So people standing. We won't know if the video is playing. It's yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thirty seconds is always silence, and then the music kicks in. They know that. We had some problems with they don't listen to instruction correctly. They don't know music is coming. And they didn't have to start. <laughs> In this edition, we played. Uh, this is a metronome kind of track, and then we changed the. Are the sensors attached or are they balanced? They are attached. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, they are also picking up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, this is in this year's edition. We played drums. It was shamanic drums because in previous editions we found found out that uh, rhythm seems to be one of the things that uh, drives movement. I'll, I'll go through the results and maybe more rationale into the experiment now. But I just wanted to see how it looks like. So they just done like that, and then there's silence, and then more, a different piece of music, and so on. This one was for eight minutes. I can already tell who did not win. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's always someone who does this, and then you're, yeah. If you do some. Uh, Excuse me, but what do you mean by. Do you, is this what you mean by rhythm? That's a good question. Uh, this is, yeah, this could be a, a rhythm. What we wanted was something that people associate with rhythm more than. Because, yeah, the, we are still kind of trying to define what, what's rhythm for us. Ah. Yeah, so exactly. So. We want something very simple in this case for this one because in previous years, so that's the other track. So this is, I don't know what's playing now. Okay. So you don't mean by rhythm? In this one, yes. But in previous ones, we've done some more complex, but yeah, I mean, sound rhythm, yeah, like percussions. And, uh, yeah, but, you, but it's a uh, period, isn't it? Yes. You're not interested in... In syncopation, for example? Well, well, not even syncopation, but just... In, in also, this is the simplest of the tracks, well, which was just uh, like a metronome yeah, kind of... Yeah, yeah, right. But you're not interested in how people fall out. 
from very mm. durations. Mm. Mm, not, the beat. No, not yet. Okay. Not yet. Yes. No. Okay. So. Yeah. Then, um, okay. So. What we want is to, to understand yeah, this relationship between music and, and the body. Uh, this uh, embodied music cognition uh, theories on how action and perception and in this case for music are strictly related and it's not uh, like one directional uh, relationship between music and movement in, this, in our case. So we want to understand how much people need movement to process musical uh, music uh, in stimuli. Uh, and uh, what's the role of, of, of um, different features of music into involuntary movement or spontaneous movement? Uh, so, and the, well, yeah, the group. There is a lot of research on, on what the group is. This, uh, this this feeling of wanting to move to music. So there are groups in, in, in Denmark studying this a lot, like defining group, what trying to measure the group. So can we measure how much people feel like moving to music in the music? So can we say this music is this amount groovier than this other music? Is that even possible? Uh, even the definition of group is a difficult one, so it's, I think, very... Uh, yeah. uh, so this is how the lab looks like. We, we organize people in, in, in the lab. In, we try to standardize how they stand in the lab. But here is where some of the limitations of the study or opportunities of the study arise. We have people standing in rows. So we have someone who's in the middle who's surrounded by others and someone who's in the corner closer to one particular speaker. So we have a quite good sound system in the lab with everywhere. You look, there are speakers. But uh, of course there are many, there is a sweet spot in the lab. So we, we're still trying to come up with analysis of that. So how position in the lab influences your results. Also, how much yeah, group relations, maybe you come to the lab with friends, which we don't control for, because it's an open day at the university, so we just invite students, or mostly prospective students, come to the university, and we announce the experiment everywhere in campus, and then if they're interested, they come to our lab. And we don't have any uh, restrictions if they are friends or not, they just come to the lab. So, we don't know. We don't. We don't know. We have any questionnaires, but we haven't run a proper analysis into how much this influences our studies. So people who know each other, people who. We do also ask if they are, if they have some musical training, if they do exercise, any particular type of exercise, uh, about their strategies for standing, if they lock their knees or not, if they close their eyes or not. We have that data. Um, so. Again, it's just one marker on top, of head, on top of their heads. So it's mostly head sway that we measure. If they manage to control head sway, and I mean, I guess there are strategies for moving your body with moving your head, like balancing the, the marker. Thing. But I don't know if they try that. How aware are they that it's the marker we're measuring and not the whole body? Some of them are not familiar with the technology, so they don't know what is it that we're doing. <laughs> yeah, how do we measure how much they move? Many of them don't know. So it all started with. I mean, our first kind of uh, analysis was uh, published uh, in Sound and Music and Computing Proceedings. And this was a very straightforward, uh, simple statistical analysis of, of who moved more uh, and in which piece of music did they move more. Uh, so some just uh, significance on, on electronic dance music and salsa. And yeah, no surprise. The rest was meditation music, uh, like museum kind of sounds. Uh, and people move more even in those than in silence. So they even move more with meditation music than in silence segments. But uh, the biggest movement was during electronic dance music and during salsa. But that was very superficial kind of analysis. So we knew there is there's a lot of things going on. So from because we discovered that we had this strong effect of electronic dance music. In 2017, we chose only electronic dance music segments. And we tried to choose them to, to choose them from quite a simplistic uh, piece with just some rhythms and not a lot of things going on in the track to very complex, like lots of things happening in the track. This is 40 seconds segments of the, of the pieces. And we did the same silence music for electronic dance music. And what we wanted was to understand more factors that 
happen during this paradigm. So we run linear mixed effect models, uh, inputting with factors uh, such as the stimuli, uh, the group. So if you were group one or group two, if there were significant differences for groups and uh, differences between, like baseline differences between subjects, participants. Uh, so I don't know if you're familiar with linear mixed effect models, but uh, but you are modeling uh, a, a, a phenomenon as not only being influenced by one main effect, but also by effects that change, in this case, per subject. So they are random random intercepts or random slopes. So the model, I don't know if I have it here. Yeah, I don't have it here. Yeah. Mixed effects. Mixed effects linear mixed effects model. So the way it does is we are trying to predict how much they move from a series of factors. One, we made it fixed, which was the stimuli. So the stimuli is always affecting them. That's our hypothesis. And then the fixed, the, the mixed effects, they can be random and they change between participants, between groups. So how much music or silence influence them for per group or per, per participant. So again, EDM was electronic dance music was significant um, for all participants. So that's what we knew, confirming our previous results. But then, would you characterize EDM as having the highest frequency of uh, of a prominent beat in it? Yes. Yeah. Of all the other styles. Yeah. Also, in this one, it was only EDM. But we were increasing exactly the, the frequency or the, the density of the of the events and the piece. I mean, we chose four tracks, starting with very simplistic and going. The fourth one was very dense in things going on, onsets. No many note onsets happening here, yeah. and they were played randomized. So we it was not always that you had the simplest one at first and the most complex one at last. So the next group might have this. The, yeah, it was always randomized between groups. Um, so. We did some cross correlation between events in the music and events in the movement uh, that we measured. So just trying to see if there was some yeah, correlation between movement and events in the music. Events we are measuring, in this case we measured RMS, which is kind of the amplitude of the sound wave, spectral centroid, the, the brightness of the sound, and pulse clarity. So yeah, oh, clear, how clear is, is the pulse for? Is that brightness related to travel? Or? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, what we did was uh, we computed this window, like in Windows, for the pieces that we played. Each of these that pulls clarity every every second, and the same RMS RMS every second, and we ended up with some sort of uh, yeah time series for this, and we cross correlated that time series with the time series of movement, Just trying to understand when. What, when something happens in the pulse clarity, are we seeing something in the movement and so on? And there was not much on, in the horizontal movement, in three dimensional, but we had some effects on the vertical movement for pulse clarity. So pulse apparently had some significant effect on, on head sweep. Yeah. Uh, vertical head sweep. So, were you able to uh, gather information from the participants, like how often they listen to music or what kind of music? Yes, yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah, also music preferences, which is something we are running a new study now on, on the um, interpersonal kind of differences and um, personality traits of participants. We're, we're also involving, yeah, how how much do they listen to music, what kinds of music do they listen to, and also a new study on if you use headphones or speakers for listening to music and how that influences your movement. So we run a similar paradigm, but now we, once we expose them only with speakers and in a second trial with headphones, with the same kind of paradigm. Stand still and listen to music, headphones listen to the same music but no speakers. And uh, there is a difference, of course, if you listen to music with speakers or with headphones. And it depends also in like, what do you normally use when you listen to music? Did you, did you ask them to just keep time to see if they could do that? No, we haven't. But oh. no, not, not, yeah, exactly. We have, we have or some. Or even whether playing some music they could keep 
Yeah. yeah, we didn't. We do have data, on, I mean, responses on if they play an instrument and what instrument yeah. do they play. Yeah. So we can tell which one has some musical training and if that musical training has to do with a rhythm instrument or a melodic or or if they are singers. We're interested in people who can't keep time. Mm. There's a way of helping us understand how people do keep time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's something interesting. Also, some of the strategies, we also asked them some of them if they had some comments at the end of the experiment. And many of them reported on the strategy of counting because, because they knew it was going to be six minutes. So they tried to <laughs> just count six minutes in their heads. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we don't know how that uh, um, Were you looking to see if uh, the movements, mm. or like the attack, the onset of movement, was related to to the events. Was that something of interest? Uh, yeah, this is uh, this cross correlation that we did. I think. Yeah. That, and we only saw. So what we were measuring there was the the, the lag between the signals. So when something happened in pulse clarity, yeah. how long after or before something happened in the movement? Yeah. And there weren't any significant relationships all on, only on the on the vertical so that's movement. So that's the one. So vertical movement and events in the music were significantly cross-correlated. So, so, so vertical is whenever the sensor picked up uh, drop or gain in yeah. the vertical positionality. Yes. Yeah. So if I'm doing this, it would be zero. Mm -hmm. If I, I do this, this is yes, the, yeah. And uh, were they all were all of the forms of music significantly different in silence? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, this was uh, and this one was electronic dance music, Norwegian folk music, which is fiddle, and Indian uh, classical music, uh, vocal. Uh, we also made sure that there were no lyrics in the in the songs and the play in music we played, so they, that wasn't an extra factor to account for. So it was, and it also we also asked for familiarity with the music. So have you are you familiar with this style of music and have you heard these songs before? Even the electronic dance music tracks were a bit obscure. They weren't like main, mainstream songs. So none of them reported on having heard these particular songs before. Of course, they were familiar with EDM. And because it's in Norway, they were familiar with Telespina, with the Norwegian folk music. But they weren't, many of them weren't familiar with the Indian classical music. And it didn't factor in, I guess, there was no significant uh, correlation between familiarity with the music and how much they were. Was there a beat in the Indian music? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I can show it to you later if you want to hear it. Uh, so Tetya Sweeney, do you know her? She was here, she's a researcher at, at our center. She was the performer for that track. So she, she sings. Uh, she was, it was one of her tracks that we played. So we, it's like a raga yeah. without tabla and yeah. sitar. Um, so in 2018, that's the one we did with only electronic dance music. So here you see the, the, the tempo for the tracks, the more the most complex one was a greater tempo, but we were more focused on, on the amount of, of notes, or yeah, the density of notes in the tracks. We try to have tracks with low kind of density to very more, much more complicated tracks. Uh, you gave half of them ecstasy, is that right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. They controlled it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, never fails. Uh, so for that one, because we know now that there were some, we knew that there were some relationships between the, the, like the, the events in the music and the movement that we are seeing. And this is very simple, again, paradigm where we have just one market. We're just measuring heavily. But then we wanted to see if there was some periodicity in what's going on, if, there is, if this cross-correlation can be translated as some periodicity that's similar to the periodicity in the music that they're hearing. There is some rhythm in how they move, in how the music. Uh, but we tried like more um, like familiar approaches like autocorrelation and, and it didn't show anything. If you see the data that we have, it looks very, looks like noise many times because they don't move much. So it looks, it's millimeters that they move and it's, it's it's very tricky to see some patterns there, with, even with more standard like analysis. So we started looking at, at the nonlinear analysis of human movement. Um, so we wanted to understand long-range correlations. We said maybe the correlations are not that evident, but they are. There is some self-similarity going on here, so some uh, fractal kind of behavior. Then 
I mean, uh, we started doing some research on, on human behavior and, and non-linearities. And yeah, we found out that many of behavioral outputs from, from humans are reflect pink noise. So they have this self-similarity structure. So if you measure heart rate or some brain signals, breathing patterns, posture measured as uh, the center of mass of the body, there is some uh, fractality in the signals. There is some fluctuations that vary in long at the long range. So these fluctuations repeat themselves at different scales of time. And we thought that's probably the, the way to go to understand how music influences. So there is also this kind of structure in music in a way. So we started looking at, at uh, nonlinear analysis of these signals. So again, uh, yeah, human outputs, uh, behavior from, from outputs from human behavior are normally nonlinear. So uh, what we thought is let's let's do some uh, let's try to measure these fluctuations in these outputs in a little gap and see if it is indeed nonlinear fractal in nature and if this fractality is somehow affected by music. There are some studies on how like human posture is fractal in nature and healthy individuals are characterized with, by highly fractal uh, displacement of your center of mass to keep balance, to keep standing. When you start to, to, to grow uh, certain conditions that um, affect your, your balance, then this fractality has been measured and it goes, goes down. So, and that also is true for other human signals like heart rate variability. So fractality in heart rate decreases as, as we grow old or as, as we develop conditions. And so a healthy population are characterized by uh, uh, deviations from the fractality of, of these signals. So we wanted to see music and if what, what we are actually measuring is this. If we are measuring this, how music affects how we control our posture. Uh, so the way um, a fractal kind of signal or output looks like is, again, it's fractal because the fluctuations that you're measuring, they change with scale. So if you measure, depending on the ruler with which you measure, you will find similar uh, structures or you have a, a different number. Uh, a very popular example of this is the coastline in countries. So if you measure from a map with a big ruler, the, the coastline in England or in Britain, so you have a number. As you zoom in, you measure more detail and then the number grows bigger and it grows as big as you zoom in. So it's that, that work also from Norway. Yes, of course, <laughs> with the fjords. The, the, the coastline of Norway with fjords is like one of the longest in the world. Without fjords, if you just measure it then. And that's exactly what one of the features of fractality. So we were thinking maybe, yeah, maybe we are not measuring with the right ruler. So you measure fractality by, or one measure of fractality is the exponent. So this relationship is uh, uh, an exponential one. So it's a power law uh, structure and that's why the pink noise comes into space. So the pink noise is the, the color of light that this one. Okay. So if you model fluctuations and the time in which you are measuring them, there is an exponential relationship. Uh, if you do the logarithmic, then it's a line, and this uh, this slope is this ex is the exponent of this. So, so the fluctuations are a function of the scale, and the scale is given by this exponent. This exponent tells you how fractal something is. So, how close you are to this relationship. If it's if it's one, then you have the pink noise. So, the interesting thing about this is that. Again, many studies have shown that human behavior is very close to pink noise. Healthy human behavior outputs are very close to pink noise. So alpha of one. So when they measure human standing and they measure in different conditions, and they then take this, they measure this exponent, these fluctuations for center of mass displacement, they get something close to one for healthy individuals, 0 0.8, 1.2. And as something happens to the body, or if there's some perturbations, then it goes either down towards white noise, 0.5 alpha, or very high up to Brownian, Brownian 1.5. So it looks, when I started reading about this, it looked very like, too complicated, but it made, to me it made sense. 
And then when I, you just start reading all of this or seeing all these evidence, it's uh, quite uh, fascinating stuff. So we started looking at, at these things. So we wanted to measure this for our head weight. So the pink noise is, is kind of like a level of fractalness. Yes. And brown is too much and mm -hmm. white is too little. Yes. I brown think. is close, yeah, like kind of chaotic, kind of uh, random, random. And then, uh, so, so there is, the interesting thing is, this is uh, the way the body works, there's a uh, nature in general, because you see this also in processes in nature as well. So there needs to be fluctuations. And one thing that happens when we measure behavioral outputs is we try to get rid of the noise. We think like if it's noise, it's bad. Just filter it out and measure as clean as possible. But apparently that's also part of the system itself. So we need certain fluctuations in our behavior to, to control for, to adapt to perturbations. And so if you remove too much of that noise, then you go to 1.5 or something. That's also not so good. And that happens again in many processes in nature as well. So, yeah. so when that happens, mm. is there a loss of stability? Yes. Okay. So if you measure someone standing on, on a hard surface versus someone standing on foam surface, mm -hmm. so you see that, that those changes in, in this exponent. And there are many papers about that. that posturography has many studies on, on that. So, this. so is, is homeostasis characterized as attempting to assimilate the perturbation and return to the yes. thing. Yeah. And that's also the difference between standing with, the, with your eyes open or standing with your eyes closed, for example, where you have like real-time control of your surroundings with your eyes open and you're uh, like continuously controlling your posture yeah. versus kind of yeah, closing your eyes and just making some predictions on how, on how you are. The longer you stand with your eyes closed, the longer you deviate, you're just trying to predict. This is through, the, yeah. through, through the high end? Yes. Uh, so this is how our data looks like. And it doesn't look that different from from data from posturography where they measure the center of mass. So the center of mass is a closer approximation of whole body sway. We're measuring only head sway. But it doesn't look that different. So this is just the vertical kind of top view of one person's head. So how the marker moves in space. Uh, so this is the top view yeah. from the ceiling looking so from down? From the ceiling looking down. And How many people? This is one person. This is one person. This is one example. And this is... Sorry, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. Well, what is the dist total distance that they move in? Uh, this is 16 millimeters. 16 millimeters. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, if you accumulate this, they, they end up moving a lot. Because if you if six minutes moving like four millimeters per second kind of thing, so they, they do move quite a lot at the end. I'm exhausted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and this is how the data looks like, raw data, uh, for for the, the three directions of movement, like um, mediolateral, uh, anterior-posterior, and, and vertical. W would you agree that this person shifted from the left leg to the right leg, or something like that? Or, I mean, if they're either standing like a bit mm, more like mm, this or mm. a bit more like, I mean, mm. micro. Yeah, there's a lot going on on this side of it. So what happens sometimes is they, they start somehow and then they move, but after one minute they move and then they stay there. But that first movement many times is enough to yeah. make them uh, lose the, the price. <laughs> uh, so this is how the data looks. And for so in some directions you can see something going on with the music. So, so this is the 500 seconds. The whole, the whole trial. There are some uh, bumps where the music is happening in some in some directions. Uh, but then, yeah, this is what we were interested to know if there is some. Uh, so we segmented those things into music and silence. So this is 48 seconds of music, one track in particular, just one example. And this is 30 seconds of silence. So we split the data for all participants into yeah, segments where there was music and segments where there wasn't music. We call silence. There was it was not perfect silence. There, there were things going on outside the lab, and they, there's always something going on. And the systems make noise, but there is no music. Um, I think relevant to Doris' question, sometimes I've heard that when people are working at a stand-up desk, that they'll hang on one hip or the other, mm -hmm. that they're not shifting so much on the feet, but on the hip. I do that a lot, yeah. And yeah, and people do that too. Um, 
that's why the, the center of mass kind of helps because it doesn't the center of mass is kind of in the lower back it doesn't move that much when you do i mean it moves but it's not as sensitive to these very small changes head so it's very sensitive to this thing so just nodding or any movement that you want your neck you will see it here but there are studies on the on, on head sway and, and perception um, i think i have some references here where they ask people to blindly judge the length of an object i think this is um Turby? is that michael Turby? maybe maybe i, I have a kid um they do it according to apparently they do it according to the uh uh, disfigurement of the of the tissues. Yes, they, they try to the torque and the, yeah. and the weight of yeah, the that's object. Turby and and uh, Coelho, Coelho. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And they were measuring head sway actually, and the fractality of head sway and how it influences the, the the judgment. So how close they were to the real length of the object, depending on head sway fractality. And there were some interesting relationships there. So again, yeah, as you approximate the noise, your perception is uh, better informed. So we were, yeah, it gives us more. Uh, evidence that maybe this is the right way to go. So once we have these segments split into music and silence, we run the way, again, those plots that I showed you of the exponential kind of power law structure. So there's this technique called the trended regression analysis. You have your time series and then you just approximate uh, a line to it. So that's called the trending. And then you measure the fluctuations. So how, how far, how, how much is deviating the original time series to a fitted line and you measure that in windows of time, and then you measure in, in dif of different sizes. So you increase, you measure first in windows of 0.5 seconds. I don't know if this is clear, but then you measure in 0.5 seconds, every 0.5 seconds, how much the original time series is deviating from a feet. So you're measuring the fluctuations, and then you increase the window size. You measure that at different scales. And then you come up with the same, at the end you have the same similar plot of exponential thing, and you have the same kind of equation uh, with your alpha exponent there, so you can calculate this exponent, so how much the fluctuations vary with scale. Uh, so we ran that for our data, and there were some significant differences between silence and, and music segments. This is yeah, the alpha exponent in the three directions. Interestingly, okay, see, this is the one that shows it. Yeah, for the vertical direction, the alpha exponent was always very low. It was approximating this white noise. Thing. And this is, is similar to what we found in previous studies where vertical movement was more affected by music. So vertical head sway, fractality was always very low. Even without music, yeah, 0.6 something. The rest were approximating like normal human kind of outputs, 0.80 something. And yeah, so this is just for comparison. So the, the solid lines are the two kind of deviations from, from the norm. So one here is brown line, brownian noise and the other 1.5, the white noise. And this is how the participants behave. Um, so you can see this, this is vertical. So vertical in music and silence was always close to white noise. And this is the other two directions which were affected as you can see but uh, but always around the point eight. What would you predict if uh, music were played for someone who is sleeping or in a coma? Are there <laughs> any data like that? Good question. Because you can imagine that part of the, the effect is a conscious effort to suppress. Yes. Or it could just be that your body just will naturally respond to it even while in various stages of sleep. Yeah, good question. And that's, yeah. We don't know that. I guess, I guess it would, wouldn't be affected. I mean, that's my, but I, I don't have any evidence to that. So I would just, yeah, my hunch is that it wouldn't be affected. Someone sleeping, but do I think. Do you think that someone sleeping wouldn't respond to music? Yeah, if it, yeah, I mean, if it doesn't wake that person, up, I guess it wouldn't. But I don't. Know. Yeah. You might depend if they're in REM sleep or some other sleep. Mm -hmm. Because there were some studies by uh, by trainer, Laura Trainer, you know, you hear about her, but she does uh, music and movement studies, and they, her group did this study on, on passive movement, so they moved the participants to music. So they were like lying on the bed, I think, and the bed was moving, moving the, the whole body or just the head. I like one of those beds. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like a vibrating bed. 
and they they wanted to see they played these complex rhythms to them and then at the end they uh, they kind of evaluated how well they understood or how well they can describe these rhythms and they found some interesting that apparently the people as they move people who were moved and the movement doesn't have to be like in the rhythm of the music the people who were moved were more able to, to to describe the rhythm patterns, so the passive movement of the body. Um, I can share those uh, references. He's a Laurel trainer and, uh, in McMaster in, in Hamilton. Um, so, because we we like how we could input all of our variables into these linear mixed effects models, we run the same, but now with the extra term of, of alpha, the fractality of the movement. So now, can we predict how much? how much they move. So the first models were just predicting how much they move. We call this quantity of motion by the stimuli and the subject and the, and the condition. But can we also predict this fractality by the same, the same way? And we ran it and, and we had some nice uh, results. So this is kind of the significant which tracks were significant for the fractality of movement in the different directions, mediolateral, anterior, posterior, vertical, and the, the norm of the movement, like kind of global three-dimensional movement. So again, in vertical, you can see that all the tracks and even some silent segments uh, significantly change the, the fractality of the movement. While in mediolateral, uh, yeah, only two tracks were significantly affecting movement. Even the metronome, the very simple track, was uh, affecting the public. So, so something that's not included there was, you tested, but it was not significant? Yes, yeah, yeah. If it's not here, it's not, yeah. So we tested for all the stimuli and all the silent segments in particular, because we were also interested if the last silent segment, they are tired, they are maybe moving more in the last silent segment, but it, it wasn't a clear trend. All these effects are some are things that the naked eye could never catch. I think, yeah. Right? yeah you're yeah, sitting there in lab, yeah. six minutes people are standing there, and you're like, yeah, maybe this experiment failed. Like, you never know. Totally yeah, yeah. And you well, 15 centimeters is like uh, 0.8 inches. So you could probably see if someone moved 0.8 of an inch, but not if it was very subtle over time. When we see this, when we play fast forward the video, mm -hmm. then we do see people doing this. So then you see some like, and then you see some people moving fast forward. In normal speed, you don't see much. I mean, you do see some like head, like some people who do, do this, and then you know, they but, lose. yeah, <laughs> loss, one less, yeah, and yeah. So also we have people in some groups, and that's also something we we have to discard some groups because people laugh. So they laugh? find it funny. <laughs> so they laugh and they, yes, and then <laughs> they basically ruin the group because then we don't know how much the laughter will influence the others. So we have to discard the whole group. So we. See, it struck me that like you could win if you could get other people to laugh. Maybe yeah. <laughs> if you could say something really funny. Make a silly face. <laughs> yeah, they're not seeing your face. You cannot see other fa other people's faces. You can hear them. So a, a, a funny noise or something, and then a joke. Yeah, a joke. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think something that happened because it was this group, there was this group of friends, so they were saying something funny and they started laughing, and that uncontrollable laughter, that and very <laughs> contagious. So well, we had to was person one. Yes. Yeah. So you, you, they put their mouth. But when they, they could. laugh, I mean, we we do ask them to stand in silence, like that they didn't listen. But I thought I saw someone cough. Yeah, that yeah, they can cough. That would be all over for her. Yeah. Yeah, coughing or yeah, even like if you start in the wrong posture and then you have to adapt because you feel like then you you lost. I heard a thing from Alexander anecdotally that once you brought in a, a a monk, a shamanic drummer, and he won. She was a winner from 2017. <laughs> so we were so this because we when we we start with every day when we run this the first group is us the group so just to try the equipment to see if everything is working and we measure we go through this all the the pipeline to measure the things and alexander is always very good in, in moving not moving so at the end of the day it was almost the last group and everyone was very far from alexander's score so we thought okay you will win i mean we're not participating alexander is the uh, ah, the, the, pro the project leader the principal investigator um, and then in the very last group, uh, there was this woman, and she came in with her huge drum. She was a shamanic drummer, uh, Sami culture, I don't know if you know, yeah, the Sami culture in the north of Norway. 
So she was a Sami. Finland. Yes, in Finland and Norway. Um, and she participated and she won. I mean, she she was the last group. We measured that and we know that she won. She got her prize and everything. <laughs> so the inter that was the same year we was at the Royal Palace Garden. And he, he did average and this uh, woman won. And we have also some reports that meditation and people who do meditation, they normally do good well. So, yeah, what we, I mean, from this analysis, apparently there is some fractal structure in how we, at least in our paradigm, how people respond to music, uh, and that it, this structure is affected by by music itself. So, we can now say that there is this long-range correlations to it, it's like self-similarity structure where depending on the scale you measure you, you have a different level of fluctuations and this scale varies with music or yeah it's affected by music so uh, that's that paper is was accepted this week actually um, in motor behavior so it's uh, the name is something like yeah, fractal analysis of movement to music yeah, I can get it for the there is a whole description of how we did it and all the structure there. But the, uh, in March this year, we, we, we ran this study again, 2019 Championship of Standstill. And this time, this is the time where we tried only with shamanic drums. Uh, shamanic drums. So we made up these tracks of shaman drums uh, of different kind of rhythm structures, more going from a very simple metronome to very syncopated kind of rhythms. And we did the same thing, we ran into people, and we are in the process of analyzing the data. Uh, we know that, or we think that the way to go is this kind of non-linear analysis of our data sets, so we now will be running also recurrence quantification analysis. So we want to see if this periodicity that we feel there should be, that we can measure it with recurrence. Maybe not with traditional approaches, but with recurrence. And uh, so the works uh, by, uh, by Michael Riley, I think, is on some of that. And, uh, and Ramesh uh, is on some of that one. And Ramesh has done a lot of this uh, center of mass fractality. Uh, so we have this data set now, and we have all the championships data sets. So our next step is to measure if, if this is true for all the championships in time, and if, if in the new championship we can find the same patterns. And, and also some of these feature extractions, can we compare this not with the whole music but only maybe with the rhythm in the music with the pulse clarity again and how this affects uh, cognition and perception so this is just how to get numbers so that we can get to some of the conclusions that we have come up with uh, but this is how the recurrence quantification analysis looks like for those of you who are not familiar with it you just plot kind of the same signal against itself uh, again at different uh, scales and then you measure how much a value or a window of values repeat itself in the signal so if you have a certain value repeating itself in time how much this is a, a recurrence plot but the analysis is basically counting these colors this color change and then you have some numbers that tell you a lot about the signal determinism and, and recurrences and entropy of the signal so our next step is to look at the nonlinear uh, features of, of human movement to music, looking to understand yeah, why we move to music and how does the brain work when we are, in this case, trying to not to move to music. And that's it for this one. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah I'd like to hear your comments and questions or anything. And there's a lot we are still figuring out about this. So. I'm kind of curious, I don't know much about fractal, yeah. but I understand why they're useful in major coastlines. <laughs> I guess I'm not, I'm wondering, is there something, like if you didn't use the fractals at all, would you still find differences between uh, no music and EDM? Um, we did find them. I like yeah, Even just pure linear yeah, just like a NOMA or the T test. I mean, there were differences between how much they move to one or significant differences. So you find better fit with a fractal. Yeah, the thing is, 
with the non-linear kind of analysis, we, we found that there were differences, but we didn't know exactly where those differences happen or why or, or how significant are they. So we, we believe that with non-linear analysis, we can detect points in time that like, the, the fractality was broken here with, when this happened with the, in the music. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, why is fractality better than like other nonlinearity, like an exponential nonlinear or logarithmic or cubic or something like that? Mm. Uh, in this case, because we are not uh, modeling the signal itself, we our, our final goal is to understand this aspect of human behavior. Or, and there is, we have a lot of background, or there is a lot of background on. on on yeah, norm, norm values for human behavior on the fractality of human behavior. So we want to compare, so we have something to compare with uh, our partic very particular paradigm, but there is a lot done similar in A lot of prior research using fractality. Yes. So what is it physiologically that makes us fractal? Like, do you have a, a simple answer? Like, I understand why coastlines are fractal, yeah. but why are bodies with all these gazillion of physiological processes going on. I think that's exactly what it is. And that's the explanation that you find in all of these books and, and papers about fractal in human behavior. That because of so many things, even with posture control, it's so complex. There are many things happening, like physical and, and psychological factors going on. So the, the body doesn't work like in an adding. It's not linear. So we don't just add like perturbation plus minus pain plus another perturbation plus vision it's not just adding but it's a it's a nonlinear mix of all these complex processes that go on for, in this case for standing but also for controlling all your your body reactions and, and the feedback through all the these feedback. mechanisms yes. occurs on different time scales yes exactly yeah you don't yeah you're hearing, you're, you're, you're seeing things at different time ranges, time scales, and you're responding to those in many different ways. Like every single part of your system responds at similar times as well. So does this sort of mean that like a fractal at a certain scale is reflecting your uh, bone structure, another one might be your vestibular, your cochlear yes. system? Yes, exactly. I see. But you don't know exactly which fractal is Not relating yet. to which bodily system. Not yet. There are some works on, on, on that, on, on posture and balance, where they, they have described some like frequency ranges for if, if there is a perturbation in this range, then it's the vestibular system, if it's in this range, then it's the, the, the visual kind of uh, sensory system. I can share literature on that if you're interested, because there's, yeah, every time I read something, it's, it's really fascinating. That's probably very helpful. observing a work of art that has here, like a Jackson Pollock where there's evidence of motion um, that's maybe not, it's not in that moment, but that's how someone can be Animating the static? Yeah. I haven't Yeah, we don't, but that would be something interesting. We are, we have done some experiment, experiments with eye trackers uh, looking like where is people looking at when they are standing still to music? We haven't analyzed that data, but, but it's there. Also, like, like we talked about pupil size and the, re the relationship between pupil size and, and stimulation or uh, level of alertness, I think. But nothing on, on visual reference yet. At least not that we know. Yeah, because deaf people can experience rhythm in, in motion or the vibration of the floor. Yes. Which is another of the the reasons why we ran this study comparing headphones versus speakers. When you have speaker, when you have speakers and a and a, and a subwoofer, the, the sound physically moves you, right? You have the vibration in all of your body. Feeling. You feel it, and you are moved. So with this system, we can measure that. I mean, we could measure basically those, but that's not necessarily that they are responding cognitively to music, but that the music is basically make them making them vibrate. So that's another aspect that we haven't looked so much into, like, yeah, physically. Do you find differences in the kind of music that they use? Like, different kinds of music? Yeah, like the Indian thing. Mm. Was, was that different from 
electronic yes yes it's a lot yeah, yeah. Uh, it, again, it was electronic dance music was much more influenced, like influenced much more their movement. And Indian was the least one. The, the one that influenced them the least was Indian music, like this very melodic, uh, unfamiliar track. They didn't move so much for that, but they still move more to that than silence. What, what do we know about like the very basic the neurophysiology of uh, of stimuli? I mean, if I hear a noise, I'll probably turn or I'll stop. The, I'll have some kind of effect. I don't know if it comes, keeps going over and over each time. I go, what is that? What is that? What is that? But you'd imagine that a sensory stimulus somehow engages your attention in ways that even if they're infinitesimal, they still will cause some kind of registering of, of the little dots. Mm -hmm. We were we're very interested in these transitions, like when it goes from silence to music. Like zooming in almost in this almost uh, again in this fractal kind of nature, zooming into this very two seconds where it goes from silence to music, and there is some interesting. We have we're running some analysis yet, and we don't have conclusive numbers yet. But there is there seems to be a trend that the previous music is still influencing them as as they go into silence. So they are en entrained somehow, and they are kept entrained during the silence period for about half of the silent period and then they start to de-entrain from the previous music and then the music comes in again but uh, is this more like a little jolt? yes yeah in many in many cases again this is very variable between participants but in many cases you have this kind of startle when the music starts and then the whole music they remain in a certain level of movement and then as the music decreases it's not a sudden drop in the silence period it drops kind of gradually so they what we believe is that there is some level of entrainment that keeps on, keeps going on as, as during the silence period. Is it physical? Is it people replaying the music in their mind? Any that sense we of don't that? know. Uh, we, it might be the, the like you just keep it playing. Like it, it depends also a lot on, and we have to run that as well. And it grows com in complexity, but not only familiarity but preferences. Of music so if they if they enjoyed the track that was played maybe it's more probable they just kept it in their heads for the silent segment or if they hated it maybe also maybe they also move more because they hate it uh, <laughs> so that's those are uh, maybe you know this but there's a literature on suppressing emotions mm -hmm. and uh, some of the findings are that it is uh, difficult to suppress your emotions uh, that is like if you're watching a scary movie and you're told beforehand that you know, like to keep, the, keep yourself cool during it, then you feel worse later. That is, the yeah. suppression is like an active thing. It's sort of like, you know, when you're standing, you have agonist and antagonist muscles that are in this balance. So that if you're sort of suppressing it, you have to have this, like, release later somehow. And, and I'm like, so I imagine that perhaps how much they enjoy the music is also something like, you know, even though even though this is giving you the boogie fever, do not move. Do not move. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Which is like we had, and that's another thing that the background of the participants. When we ran this one of uh, speakers versus headphones, we had uh, we had a participant from uh, from Mexico, and in that particular study, we didn't ask them to stand as still as possible. We asked them to stand naturally to music, and she kept asking if she could dance. <laughs> Because she couldn't like, prepare, as, I don't know how serious how serious she was, but she said that she cannot stand still the music. So she, we didn't know what to tell her because we didn't want to like no don't move because that was not part of us. We don't we didn't want to tell them. So she ended up dancing a little bit because apparently she cannot not dance the music. So we also have that aspect of people who, and I we've run some interviews with people from from Venezuela. And they also, when, they, when we tell them about this study, they, they all report that they wouldn't be able to do it. <laughs> that they just cannot not move the music. Um, I think so much of it is attentional also. Like, there's been music playing in the background for all this, right? Yeah. So the people who work here, if you ask them how often they listen to music, they might not even realize that they're listening to it like over eight hours a day. They're hearing it, but they're not listening to it. Yes. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so it, I wonder if people who work here, Way less to the music <laughs> than, than they they would, or, and maybe they would look in your experiment because it's almost like they uh, 
latent inhibition. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm. extinction. They've extinguished the uh, the pushing the aspect. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's another thing that we. Maybe uh, talk about this, but I'm wondering if the motion that you measure is synchronous with the beat in the music. With the beat, no. We didn't find it so far. We we measured some. Uh, there was some synchronization with the pulse, with the pulse, with the, pulse. the pulse, the pulse. You mean the human pulse? So, no, the, the music pulse. pulse. The pulse of the music, yes. <laughs> the pulse of the music. There was some in the vertical movement only. Yeah. So probably head nodding, some sort of head nodding. But not, but not much. Not much, no, not no. much. And only with the electronic dance music, not with others like the, the Indian music or the Norwegian folk. No. Well, we we think that there their strategies for not moving are maybe better. I mean, better for this kind of scenario. Like comparison with the Royal Palace Guard, that they are kind of trying to not get tired or injured because they are staying for eight hours. And the approach of this meditation or shamanic people is, is different. They are more in at peace. So it's kind of a completely different mindset to stand still and like normal people we have some people who's really angry at the end of the experiments people don't like standing st still we don't like standing in queues or any like, and people is sometimes kind of upset that they had to stand for for eight minutes and, and we some run some installations where we ask people to stand still so that the instrument will play music if you don't stand still the instrument doesn't do anything and some people don't like it or find it kind of yeah Counterintuitive and, and annoying. So I think if they're the shamanic, sh shamanic drummer and the people who do meditation, they they are more at peace at the standing still, and maybe they control they control the bodies in a different way, or they suppress other stimuli better. But uh, we don't know other than that. Yeah. yeah. Following up on Michael's question, what? I, I think you didn't measure it, but when the experiment was over and you say to people, okay, thank you, you may go, what were the reactions? Were some people like, yeah, and start jumping around or were they just no, walking out relaxed. in silence? No, <laughs> very silent and almost uh, always. I haven't seen a single group and I, again, we've run this four times, I think, already with me there. And uh, not a single time I've seen someone celebrating or being enthusiastic about it. They are always kind of relieved, kind of, and then they go out of the lab and kind of depressed. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm wondering because I think maybe I'll do this to my students beginning of every seminar. Yeah, and they, they will come down. Six minutes of just standing there. <laughs> Another thing that sort of relates to this is that uh, even I think in the 60s, so the, there was an influential paper written by Garcia and Kerling mm. about how uh, you can't just uh, train stimuli equally for different responses. So like in rats, it's hard for them to like press a bar to avoid a shock because pressing a bar for getting food is more natural, but when you're afraid, you should not move. And uh, so to be active when you're afraid is hard. And so if, in some respects, you're acting, asking people to act as if they're afraid, as if there's a tiger passing by, if, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, it, that could be why there's an emotional reaction as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, the, the, it's like a, uh, if I'm acting, if I'm still, something bad must yeah, be happening. Yeah. <laughs> Which is probably why we we found so such a big difference between this study and the one where we asked them to just stand naturally to music. Mm -hmm. And there was no prize in that one. So it was just stand naturally and we would play some pieces of music and some silence segments. Just stand in a comfortable position. Yeah. And it was very different. So they, they actually moved more to silence. Again, we saw in the video that many of them treated this silence as kind of a... They thought we weren't measuring there. We didn't go into so much detail, so they didn't know. They thought the silence was for them to relax. And, and their affect when they were leaving, was it similarly? No, much different, yeah. 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 That's not so true, yeah. And that's when, where we have this uh, woman dancing to some of the music, and then, so she, she moved more to music, but most of the people, 
thought that we were measuring the music, they stood naturally, and then in the silence they even like moved a lot, some of them, in the silent seconds. The answer is that the first ones were eaten by the tigers. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't survive in the, in the wild. Do you think if people were sitting, you would get different results? Good. Yeah, we have considered running one where people are sitting. We will have to change the name of this of the championship. <laughs> Keep the S. Yes, sitting still. Uh, but there are some studies on head nodding and foot tapping, uh, or on, on, on people sitting. And and there is some. Most of the studies actually do with people sitting and tapping to the table on, or, or tapping on the floor. But then they don't instruct them to stand as still as possible. They just play music to someone standing. They don't say much. And then just observe people, and they head nod and they tap too, and then they measure how much they synchronize. It's easier to measure synchronization in this one. This, this came up in a different forum when we were chatting about it, but this uh, right there is this trend in uh, office ergonomics mm. to have those tall desks mm. you can stand at, but then it, it turns out that we're actually allocating some cognitive resources Standing just to stand. So in a sense, it's actually. Uh, impairing our focus on our work. Yeah, I think uh, I, I've done it before. I mean, I've done not the sitting, but I've done the championship every every year. As I told you, we, we do it ourselves. And for me, it's uh, it's very tiring. It feels very tired. I mean, it's only six or seven minutes, but it does. I mean, you, uh, maybe my strategy is the wrong one, but I don't. I keep thinking. I I tried the counting thing, and it didn't work that much because I always count too fast. So when it's like six minutes in my head and there's still a long way to go <laughs> and it doesn't end so, and I'm just looking and waiting for it to finish and sweating and, and then just I, it's very common that we have people quitting in the middle that they feel like they will faint wow. because of, yeah and I, I felt like that the first time I think that I did it that like you feel like it's very silent and you have this I don't know this pressure that you have to stand as you mentioned that you have to stand still I don't know it can be stressful for some people and we have people like we we even ask them now that if you feel bad just sit down on your place or go to the back of the lab so we have at every championship we have at least two or three that have to do that because they cannot stand uh, still in silence uh, it's different when you're standing on a queue because then you do change strategy that's, posture that's sensory deprivation yes. water capsules what do they call it, you know mm, yeah <laughs> yeah We've also considered running it in, a, in one of these like silent kind of chambers for, for music production. But that's even even just that being there is stressful. So standing still there for six minutes, we don't have, but, uh, that's something we have considered as well. At least you can move around in the sense we have Yes. <laughs> you may not even be aware of it, but you can move around. Yeah. So, yeah, there are many things. It, it's an interesting study and there's a lot to, to that can be seen here but it's also a lot of, lots of factors and many things that do many kind of weaknesses at the same time in the paradigm this thing about the group of people how they can like someone has four people around this person and some people have only a wall in front of them so that we haven't found any uh, significant effects of this but, but there should be something there because it's not the same standing in the middle or if you have your friend on the right or someone that you never met before even studies with uh, adolescents uh, that they'll bring a, they'll bring adolescents into a, a building and they'll have them do driving simulators to see how well they do. And uh, teenagers are often more risky, uh, and they're especially risky if their friends are around. But even if they enter the building with their friends, they are riskier than if they came alone. Mm -hmm. So the mere notion that they had been with friends recently makes them drive a little bit more crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in the, in even the, if they're not around. These studies about um, joint action, synchronicity, and affect, yeah. where it's enough if, uh, if say, the, the two of us are, have some, we've never met before, and we have some little task of, I don't know, just maybe moving these things. Mm -hmm. It's if we synchronize, then later if you ask, each of us, what do you think about the other guy? I'll say, he's a great guy, yeah, I'll be, I'll be glad to hang out with him and you know, do and he'll say the same about me. Mm. Like, all we did was move things together, yes, yes. or maybe just kind of rock together, yes. and then it creates this, a fusion of affect, of yes. uh, sort of fraternity or sorority. Yeah, there are many studies on, on the recurrence analysis of, of people standing in groups, but mostly like in queues, for example, mm -hmm. and then they ask them to, to this way 
and like only the people in front of the person in front of you will sway and then without noticing you start swaying as well and in the same kind of period of the trust of person in front of you so this synchronization spontaneous kind of synchronization of sway like you are not asked to synchronize but you do synchronize Do you find you said you ask people about the musical background? Yeah. Do you find a difference? Yes, musicians move more. Like people with musical background yeah. normally move more every year. Huh? So that's also a thing. And not also... Not the drama. Not the drama. Not the drama. Not, the <laughs> not here. Yeah, that was uh, out of play. Yeah. We also had some people who... We asked them on the level of physical activity. Like if they do some level of exercise. People who exercise more, they move more which is also interesting. I mean, so it's not about kind of physical condition. So if you're fit, you won't move so much. Apparently not, apparently it's kind of the opposite. So they want to move, maybe. Do you have information about dancers versus other Also, yeah. And also they move more, of course. So dancers move more. Dancers, people who do physical activity and musicians, they move more. Then of, of course, there's these other studies that show it's not just about the uh, type of of art but particular genres like I think also this came up some conversation recently they um, so this is part of a paradigm looking at um, motor cortex activity when you are observing another person engaging in some kind of motion based practice mm -hmm. cultural practice and they took people who are experts in capoeira mm -hmm. and other people experts in, uh, in classical ballet and they showed each group videos of people doing either capoeira Of classical ballet and when you uh, saw somebody engaging in the practice that you were an expert at your motor car of course will be firing all over when you saw somebody doing another one it's like okay people are moving yeah. but uh, and for both groups yeah 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 so I'm just thinking maybe musicians are uh, they, they have a, a greater variety of styles that they are in tune mm -hmm. to yeah to certain patterns yeah. yeah we're also wondering if they Some musicians might try to think about the music that's being played or try to analyze it kind of as a way of distracting, of getting distracted. They are just thinking on the beats or on the percussions or whatever is going on in the music. And normal people or people who are not music, musicians. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> normal indeed. <laughs> All right, just to know where we stand. <laughs> yeah, but so, uh, non musicians. Like, uh, I wonder how much it has to deal directly with balance. Like if you test people's balance where like they're on a teeter totter and they have to keep the bubble mm. of the level, if that's uh, if that you know accounts for a lot of the variance. Like I, I have uh, pretty good balance, but it's very dynamic. I don't like standing, you know, and it's, it's hard for me to stay still. But dynamically, my balance, like snowboarding and things like that, is good. Uh, Riding my airway, yeah. 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 Uh, but I'm wondering if, because you know, the, the main sensor that you have about your movement is your vestibular cochlear system, right? So that seems like it's sort of the gateway system. Although certainly your skeletal, you know, things have, have an element of that too, right? So it'd be interesting to tease out the proportion of variance that balance might account for a lot of our little, it'd be an interesting hypothesis. Mm -hmm. True. Uh, I was in uh, the Congress of Biomechanics earlier this year and there was this very interesting study on people keeping uh, a stick balanced on their hands as they were sitting in a chair, but they were uh, trying to find differences in the, how well they balance the stick based on the color of the stick. Wow! So, My goodness! And so yellow, red, so then they found some differences, like yellow I think was the best for keeping balance the stick. So you had to just sit and keep the stick, and I think they were measuring motion capture of the tip of the stick or something, and how much it moves. So head sway of the stick, and in, yeah, with the factor of color, and different colors in white, black, similar color of the background, or very different, and there were some differences. It's a very interesting study. I think it's, it's just the abstract online, I think, that it was very interesting. Why did they look at color? Uh, they thought that they are thinking of a new kind of intervention strategies for people uh, who struggle with balance and they, their theory is that if this is helpful then maybe they can look up for things that have a certain color that they know that improves balance somehow. I don't know if they have a lot of previous evidence that this works uh, or if it was very exploratory in nature but they found some interesting results. I think it's, it's the same color for everyone. Yes, I mean the same colors. They turn with different sticks. Ah, the better, better at 
Yeah, the jello, I think, was looking for like a general kind of result. So you could also be a subtle visual acuity thing. Mm -hmm. uh, like yellow cars, for instance, are the most visible, mm -hmm. uh, as well as white and silver. You know, like a, a dark blue cars, you're asking to be you know, plowed into. You know. <laughs> they try with different materials, so something light and something more heavy. And length of the stick as well, but the color was always a factor. Apparently. So that's also interesting. We haven't considered that. Uh, our participants, the ones that are in front, it's just a black curtain. And the ones that are like behind it, you have someone's head in front of you. So how much do they synchronize with the head swaying? That's another thing. That so if you want to take part in Standstill 2020, when will that happen? March in Oslo. I might actually be there. <laughs> yeah, there is funding for people in Berkeley yeah. to go to Oslo. So March, it's normally the first week of March that we want this. You can start. I think for a free trip to Oslo, I would actually stand still. For <laughs> <laughs> Reason of the trip, right. championship of Stansted. Right. <laughs> yeah, you can start uh, preparing now. It's in March. Okay. And uh, last year, <laughs> last year we ran it in Oslo and in Trondheim, another city in Norway, 500 kilometers north, uh, at the same time. So we were synchronizing with this group in Trondheim and they were inviting people in, a, in the same kind of lab, same size, same, same, same dimensions of lab, same equipment. And we were measuring both with the same kind of tracks. So the competition is just, you only do it once, or is there like a no, final semi strut No, you do it once. You, you go into the lab, you do it, and then okay. And we run it in one day. So we start 9 a.m., we finish like 4 p.m. And then at around 5, and you leave the lab, you go to your home if you want, and then we call you. If you want, you can always check your result online, like to see how much you would compare to the winner and see how close you were. And we normally try to avoid people doing it twice because then that would kind of. Do people like across. take beta blockers before they get on? I don't know. Good uh, question. Yeah. We do ask. in the budget. <laughs> <laughs> we do ask them for like hearing impairments. So, uh, um, so just like an exclusion criteria because that would be a different kind of analysis. That, so, or balance impairments. So, so we try to avoid this. So you want to be deaf and a lip reader? No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Interesting. So hopefully some of you can be there in March and try it yourselves. Uh, but if not, I mean, if it's already done, or we can always do it only for you if you go there and just uh, do one standstill session. Maybe you can release your soundtrack on Spotify. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stand, uh, stand still soundtrack. <laughs> when, uh, when the project started, Alexander existed. It's, uh, our team is three people. It's Alexander, Agatha, a PhD student, I mean. uh, and the three of us used to start our meetings. Alexander insisted on starting with his six minutes standstill in silence. It was uh, weird at the beginning, and I didn't understand quite well why, but uh, yeah. now we don't do it. <laughs> but the first year we were doing it, so maybe to get used to doing it, because we had to do it at some point. So we would come to his office or to the lab and just do a very weird standstill in silence, the three of us. So you have the, the academic quarter of an hour plus the six minutes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the six minutes that it takes to finish the standstill. <laughs> and sometimes we had this uh, the, the woman doing the cleaning of the lab going in and we were just like, <laughs> oh, sorry, <laughs> something's going on here. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's fun.